Hey you, my name is Thomas Tomska Ridgewell and this is Katie Morton. Katie is a mental health expert, she's a psychotherapist, and I am someone who talks about depression on this channel a lot, and I figured it was about time to put some credibility to that and actually make my channel more of a useful resource instead of just um, a lot of subjective opinions and bring on an expert to go over the topic of depression and just depression, seeing as that's the thing that I, I know about. I'm talking a lot, aren't I? I've asked you all for questions on Twitter and I've, I've, I've followed down to about 10 questions and we're gonna go through those now. But Katie is, as I mentioned, a mental health expert. She has a channel all about this and you can click her at whenever, probably right now, uh, <laughs> to go to her channel. We'll also be linking back to her channel at the end of this video and we've done a video on her channel about, so there's a lot going on. We'll save it to the end card. Let's get into it. Dog squeeze. So okay, what is depression? Like kind of on a like scientific level, what is it? The truth of it is they don't really know. All right, moving on. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but there are some like theories and hypotheses that have been tested and things that we do know thus far about it. But there are a lot of things we don't know because in the psychology world, we can never test on a living, working brain. And so we can't actually see, we can only see post-mortem what's happening and what has happened to someone. And so what we know with depression is that serotonin and dopamine are big players in our emotions, hormones, how we feel, our mood. Those are like the happy, the happy chemicals, right? Yes. They're okay. the ones that like, yay, they flood in and you're like, I feel so good today, but I don't know why. Or the ones that are like, oh, not there. And they were like, I feel like shit. Why? Yep. So that's what I'm missing in a depressed brain, there's less of them than there probably should be. Yes, and some people are genetically predisposed to be that way, to mm -hmm. have less, um, and others may be genetically predisposed in the same to have more. And on a similar note, what, what, are there different types of depression? Um, yes, based on experience, but as far as clinically speaking, diagnostically speaking, not really. So we have different diagnostic manuals. Uh oh. But. They all cover it from my experience, what I've read and looked at, they cover the same things, but in, from what I was trained and what I've learned, there is depressive episodes that we can have within mm -hmm. other diagnoses. Then we can have grief and grieving and bereavement, mm -hmm. its own level of that. And then there's major depressive disorder. Ah, that's too many. Okay, so when it comes to identifying depression, what are some of the biggest telltale signs that someone, particularly yourself, might be suffering from depression or a form of it? The, the biggest one is what we call anhedonia, but what that really means is, I don't like the shit I used to like. Okay. I have no interest. That was a huge telltale sign for me, because I was like, I don't, I, I, it was like, I don't want to do anything, and I don't even want to play video games, and I like video games. Yeah, like if the things that you like to do, no matter what, you don't want to, mm -hmm. talk to somebody. The other two major ones are eating like a lot or not at all, like appetite changes. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Is that not part of... No, you know? I would never eat more food than I should. <laughs> I don't associate food with pain going away. <laughs> the other major one, these are the top three is really what I'm giving you, is sleeping like a ton or not sleeping at all. So sleep changes. It's such a weird, vague thing. It's like, you were going to be doing some things a lot or not enough. I know. Uh, Everybody's different. Oh, but goodness. something that is across the board, there's no like yes, like more or less, is concentration difficulties. That's one of the most overlooked signs. Okay. And so if you str are struggling to remember things, you're rereading things over and over, you can't focus in conversations, and you're like, what is going on? You know, it could be depression. So something I'm very worried about when I talk about depression is uh, encouraging my audience inadvertently to self-diagnose or misdiagnose themselves with, with depression when they might actually just be sad, just mm -hmm. normal sad. Um, yeah. How, how can you tell the difference? The difference is really if it's impairing your ability to function in your life. So are you struggling at work or school or in your relationships because of this? Mm -hmm. And obviously if we have like a down mood, right? So because yeah. mood changes are normal, uh, day to day, month to month, all sorts of things. But if it's affecting your relationships more than just like, oh, I just don't want to talk today and then tomorrow, like that's fine. If it's like severely affecting your ability to get out of bed, to go to work, to go to school, to interact with people, that's when it's diagnosable. Okay. And depression in particular, it has to be at least two weeks. Interesting. That it impairs you. Okay, okay. But I guess, and I also just end, end a bit, ultimately, if you're really unsure, go see a professional. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. If you have access to one. So, so you think you might be depressed, you want to get help, what are your next steps? Um, reaching out. 
mm-hmm. speaking up. I think that if you're in school, the best way to go about it is to start with your school counselor because often they can see you for free for many sessions or talking to your parents if you think they'd be open to it. Okay. And often we think that they wouldn't be and they are. Just throwing that out there. And but, so and what do you do if you're scared to if you're scared to reach out? Because I know if I was I was terrified for ages of uh, maybe it was just personally I was like I didn't want to be weak. Uh, I, you know, I didn't want to fail myself and admit that I had a problem. What do you do if you're scared? Start talking to your friends about it, if that's the easiest. Whatever the easiest path is, because it might not be friends, but it could be a teacher. It could be just an adult friend that you have mm-hmm. that's like a support that's always been around. Any person who you're close to, start talking about it with them, because I find that it's usually scariest just stuck in our head. Mm-hmm. But when we say it out loud, it loses all of its power. For me, it was I actually started to, I talked I talk to a camera. Uh, mm-hmm. When I didn't want, I went through a really bad uh, phase at the start of last year where I couldn't talk to anyone, so I actually talked to a camera. Um, but maybe also things that could work would be writing it down. Totally, um, you can um, write it down. You can even, for as a therapist, just so you know, a lot of my clients when they first start seeing me will sometimes bring in, like just almost like a journal entry. Okay. Or just notes like these are things I struggle with. I don't know if I'll be able to say it to you. I have my clients sometimes email me between sessions and be like, I don't know if I'll be able to bring this up, but here are some things. And so there's a lot of ways to express yourself or to get the information out there and just know that, you know, there are people there to listen and not judge. Yeah, absolutely. Because like I said, when I, when I went, when I first went to the doctors, uh, as soon as I got in front of, as soon as I got in front of a doctor, I immediately was like, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Everything's fine. I'm not in... Um, Depression what? What? <laughs> And she could, how are you? Um, <laughs> a lot of people, though, they, they they admit they need help. The first the first point of call might be their their parent or even a doctor. And sometimes, if they're younger, they're not taken seriously. Um, what do you do if you're not taken seriously? Should you go to someone else, or should you? Is there something you can do to try and make those people take you seriously? Yeah, I mean, I always tell people sometimes we have to shout to be heard. And I know that it sucks, and I know that it feels bad mm-hmm. when we finally decide to reach out to then hear like no that's not a real thing or you'll get over it or it's all in your head yeah and if you're a guy boys don't cry yeah all the shit that we hear that's garbage um knowing that you may have to i think it's a great thing to talk to someone else Mm -hmm. try someone who is that's why i always say school counselors or a trusted friend or loved one like going to them first because they're the most likely to take you seriously to hear you out okay but knowing that it's normal and that you may just have to keep saying it to prove that it's not a phase and that you're not going to grow out of it and boys do cry and it's normal to have feelings um sometimes you have to say it a few times before we get the help we need so you've finally been taken seriously you've made it to the doctors uh what's going to happen next what what, what's going to what's going to be the process you're going to go through um it's going to differ from obviously therapist to therapist and plan to plan Mm -hmm. every country has its own system but for the most part the first appointment is kind of like a get to know you Mm -hmm. so it's usually like what's bringing you in consultation yeah and and also like medical history and have you been on medication before have you seen someone before do you have brothers and sisters almost almost like i always call it like kind of like a first date Mm -hmm. where you're just kind of learning about them like hey what do you do what do you like to do what's different and honestly the first session goes by like so after that first session, though, um, if, 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 the, if the first doctor does think you might have uh, some sort of mental health issue, they're going to probably refer you to a psychotherapist, yes? Well, if it's a therapist, so it depends on who you're seeing first, right. I guess. Because if you come into my office, I am a psychotherapist, mm-hmm. and then I would refer you to a psychiatrist if I thought that you needed medication, mm-hmm. or to your general practitioner if I thought maybe it was something medical that I wanted to get checked out. Right. Because you can have different uh, thyroid issues that can cause depression. Okay when you really don't have it. Oh. Okay, so let's talk about the, the journey that, that I think people might wind up on. Uh, so some uh, psychiatrists might then recommend medication. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, tell us a little bit about medication if you can. What is it? What does it do? What's it doing? Why? Ah. <laughs> They're all very different. Um, it depends on what type of medication you get on. If you're struggling with depression, it's most likely to be put on an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Mm-hmm. You don't need to look that up. That's just a long, it's a long form way of saying it helps regulate your uh, serotonin, dopamine and serotonin. The happy drugs. Yes, it makes them more happy. Yay! Or it's or, more level and stable, I guess. Yes, yeah. so it doesn't fluctuate so much. Um, or an SNRI, um, which usually, those are, it's just a different class of the same version of right. something. And that often is what they use for anxiety. Okay. But again, I'm not a doctor. You'd have to see a medical doctor to get more information. And if your depression is severe enough, oftentimes they'll put you on an antipsychotic, which a lot of people feel like, oh my God, that's that's really scary. But trust me, it's just a different type of medication yeah. that can more intensely regulate all of those chemicals in your brain that are a little bit off kilter. Yeah, but I think, I think usually um, 
the first thing I think a doctor is going to recommend is is therapy. Yes. And then and then only if they think that the ther- therapy isn't going to be enough, they'll put you on uh, medication as well. It's supposed to go with. Yes. I think it's used between medication and therapy at the same time. That's the best outcome, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's like, with our powers combined. So you've now been diagnosed with some form of depression, and maybe you're on therapy, maybe you're on medication, maybe you're on both, maybe you're on, on nothing. Um, but what are the best natural remedies you can do? What's the, what are the best things, what are the best chances you can give yourself to live a happy, fulfilling life with depression? Um, I'll start with, like, if you're not on anything. Yeah. Let's just start there because I think there are a lot of things that we can actually do every day to help ourselves. Mm-hmm. So these are going to be a lot of kind of no-brainers, aren't they? Like you know, go outside, get yep. fresh air, and 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 shower. Yeah. So yeah, like showering regularly, exercising. Yeah. Um, let's be honest, I'm not going to do that. But exercise doesn't have to be what people think. It doesn't have to be like, oh, I hate this. This is terrible. Just walking around the block. Pokemon Go, man. Yeah. That's your exercise for the day. Just hatch hatch a five k egg. That's minimum. <laughs> Um, but also uh, like a routine, sleeping, yeah. having a decent sleep schedule, uh, yeah. going to bed at the right time, and you waking don't need up at the me right for time. This, you know. Well, these are the, these are the no-brainers that everyone's going to hear, but I think it's good to hear it from you. Have oh, you okay. nod along and confirm yes, at least? Yes, confirming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but what else? What am I missing there? Well, you can also like the sleep schedule is really important. Mm-hmm. Also, diet. And I don't mean like, oh, you can't have fatty foods or you can't have any junk food. I just mean like, make sure you're drinking enough water. That's something that people don't Mm -hmm. think about enough, but your body actually needs it. And this is something people will be surprised to know, but for our brains to operate full capacity, we actually need fat in our diet. And so if you're feeling like you're struggling to concentrate or something, try adding an avocado to your sandwich or, you know, adding in some cheese with something so that you make sure your brain is getting what it needs to Mm -hmm. create the hormones and the chemicals that it needs to create. Okay. And socializing as well. Yes. It's recommended to socialize, what, at least twice a week or? Twice a week. And, pers- and that's not like at work or at school, like no. that's actually a social event, go see and friends. And in person. Yeah. And also a weird thing, if you don't find that you have a lot of friends to go out and to see, they find that like massage and like physical touch is really beneficial to how we feel. Oh, really? And so getting a massage could help just because it's human contact and we actually need that. So you're, you're taking care of your natural remedies, you're, you're taking the professional healthcare route as well. However, you've got depression, you're still probably gonna have depressive episodes, ranging in severity, maybe major depressive episodes, maybe mild ones. What should you do during a depressive episode? Um, reach out to your team. Like okay. your professional team and your support team. Like so what friends. is what? Yeah, what is your team? So I always say I always call it like your team. So it's like your treatment team as a whole, and that means like your friends and your family and your supportive loved ones, the ones that you could tell like, hey, I'm having a really hard time mm-hmm. too. Those people. But first, call your therapist, call your psychiatrist, because it's normal when we have life stressors, situations that come up. Maybe we lose a loved one. Maybe we're moving. Maybe we're going back to school. There's a zillion changing jobs, mm-hmm. all sorts of things. Um, where our symptoms can get worse for a short period of time. And so they can increase your medication for that period of time. You can increase the number of sessions that you have, or they give you more, you know, tools to use, like journal more, or listen to more music, or walk more. Or, you know, there's a bunch of different things we can do behaviorally to help out as well. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm never really sure personally what to do when I'm having a big depressive episode, because I know that if I, if I then put myself in a social setting, if I see friends, mm-hmm. then I, I'm no longer focusing on my own issues. I'm kind of go, going into it as a character. Mm-hmm. And I feel, I, I wonder if that's a little self-destructive and maybe I should, should be just giving myself some time alone to recover. Would you recommend that or? Yeah, I would. But that's why I say call it, contact your professional team first, mm-hmm. because I would check in with them. Yeah. Because there may be something more you, that they can do for you. Yeah. But at the same time, listening to yourself, like being in social situations when we don't want to be, isn't good. It's not good for us. It's not good for our relationships. No, the, and then we're kind of faking it. Yeah. The way I put it is it's kind of like, uh, you know, if there's a wall, uh, this is the kind of wall where you're going to run at it and you're going to break and, and not the wall. One thing I do actually is I have uh, with my team, uh, mm-hmm. they, I have a color coded system. I, I have a, co- a code yellow, a code orange, a code red, and a code black. And these are just like ways to very simply just say like, so like a code yellow for me is like, oh, I'm I'm having a little bit of a bad time. Like I need like half an hour, like 10 minutes just to recover. Like maybe I'm gonna go listen to some music alone and then I'll be right back. A code red is like, no, co- sorry, a code orange is like, um, like I'm in a bad, I'm in a bad way right now. This is gonna last maybe a couple hours. Like maybe I, I, I shouldn't come out. Maybe I should go home. A code red is like, oh, the day is boned. Like everything is Normal. bad. This is a very, this is this is a severe depressive episode, um, and that's usually when I would like a friend to be just around me. Mm-hmm. And a code black, of course, is is uh, suicidal thoughts. And I've never had a code black, but it, I think it's important to, for my support team to know that because you know if I felt if I were to feel suicidal, I'm probably not gonna 
text my friends, I'm yeah. feeling suicidal. So I have a thing called a code black that I can reach out. So it's, mm-hmm. it's good to communicate with your friends, let them know where you're at and, and stuff. Yeah, and make it quick and easy for you because mm. that, that's what's so great about what you do. Like That's a great plan because often when we're having the hardest time is when we can't reach out. So speaking of a code black, what to do if it gets real bad and you are having thoughts of suicide? First thing though, uh, how do you reckon you can identify a genuine suicidal thought as opposed to just thinking about death, thinking about killing yourself, just like as a, as a theoretical, a passive thought, kind yeah, of. just a passive thought as opposed to an active, like, how, how do you know when you're actually genuinely at risk of suicide? For me, as a clinician, the way that I assess it is, are they scared of it? Mm-hmm. Because I know that sounds really weird, but I'll, that's what I usually check in with my clients, like, are you still scared of dying? And they'll be like, yeah. And you know, that's mm-hmm. one of the things that I do, because if you're not afraid anymore, then that to me, love, like it increased your risk of actually trying. Right. Interesting. Also having the means and having a plan that those are two things to look for. And if they've done anything like one of the key markers is if, oh, they gave away that uh, piece of jewelry that was like their great, great grandma's that meant a lot to them, or they started like, oh, I finally paid off all my bills and I did this thing. Like they start like closing up shop kind of in a way. Right. Um, those are things I look for. And so honestly for you out there, if you're struggling, if it's something that you're putting a plan together, or maybe you're hoarding pills or whatever, um, those are indicators that you should probably reach out. Let me know if I, if I step out of line here, but mm-hmm. something that I have heard is that when someone has actually made the decision to end their life, they actually kind of reach a state of peace mm-hmm. and calm. Yep. And yet they start closing up their affairs. They seem very okay. Mm-hmm. And that's actually, that's actually can be the scariest sign. Well, it's like the eye of the storm. Yeah, because yeah. They're, when they're expressing discontent and upset is honestly when they're still grappling with the idea. And then once they've decided, it's yeah. like a relief. So would you say like it's actually, it's, someone is less a suicide risk and if they're talking about it, mm-hmm. like if you're, if, you, if someone is genuinely tweeting, I'm thinking about killing myself, that they're actually less of, at a risk. Yeah, they're actually reaching out for help. That's yeah. actually like them saying, I'm thinking about it, I don't like it. Yeah, help, stop, Here's I don't want to do this. Flags. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. so it's when someone goes quiet, that's when, it, that's yeah. when it's scary. Yeah. However, like, okay, so that's that's if you're looking at someone else, but now this is you. So you are, now you are feeling those suicidal thoughts. Um, you are, gen, you, you have found yourself making a plan. Um, last ditch attempt, what should someone do in that situation? Reach out. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't care if it's 911, I don't care if it's a suicide hotline. There are suicide texts, there's like a text line. Now. Really, okay. That's, it's, you know, all within your text plan, obviously, but it's essentially free and there are people available 24 seven. I had a friend who did the suicide hotline for a while. Mm-hmm. It's like a cell phone you carry around, you know, and you're on call. Yeah, and these people obviously aren't going to judge you. Like no. that is their job. And they're mental health professionals. Yeah. yeah. Or at least in training, like it was when we were interns. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are resources. Even just calling a friend and being like, I just really need to hang out with me. Mm-hmm. But I guess in this theoretical, like maybe this, the, the person who's, who's felt this way, like maybe they don't actually have yeah, they're people isolated. to reach out to. Uh, I think if it, it's got that far, like they haven't had anyone to tweet, I want to kill myself at, you know. Yeah. And that's why um, I think this, the hotlines are great. You can even just take yourself to the hospital. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you'd be able to, but you can, but that's what 911 is there for. Mm-hmm. And they can send out a psychological evaluation team to talk with you and to assess you and get you the help that you need. And you know, if you had to say something to a suicidal person, uh, give them a reason to not, uh, do you have anything that you, w- you, you would go to? What, what would be your go-to to say to someone who is contemplating suicide if they're really dark? I always tell them like, I know it feels hopeless. I know it feels like there's no way out, but there always is and there's better and you deserve it. And so just reaching out for help this one last time could be the thing that really pulls you out of this because life can get better and it will get better. Sometimes we just need some extra support and you're not alone with it. And mm-hmm. it's not, nothing's wrong with you. Sometimes we just need some people to help pull us out. I think that is always so important to note is that you are not alone. You are so mm-hmm. far from alone. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, if you have a broken leg, uh, you can, you're not gonna feel that alone because you, you know other people have had broken legs. You can see it, you can you can go near a hospital if you see 10 people with broken legs. <laughs> yeah. If you have a mental health issue, no one, we're not Sims, we're not walking around with a spinning red no, diamond does. above us, like, um, but you are so, so not alone. I mean, just look at the views on this video, look at the comments uh, yeah. below this video, like, there are a lot of people out there. Um, what is the number of people who will be affected by mental health issues? Uh, one in four, they say, globally are affected, but if you consider the fact that if 
I like I've had loved ones that who've had mental illness. So then therefore I'm affected. So I would say that 100% of people know something have been affected in some way by mental illness. So speaking of someone in your life that has uh, a mental health issue, but maybe it's undiagnosed. Um, uh -huh. How do you, first of all, if you think someone you, you care about has depression, how can you help them? How can you encourage them to potentially go get help? I think the, it usually starts by just letting them know you're there because a lot of my clients who feel depressed will feel like they're alone mm -hmm. and like no one will understand. And so I always encourage people to, to remind them that they're there and maybe share something about your own experience so that they know that you can relate because often they're afraid to like dump on you or put too much on you. So but don't try and be one of those one up of friends no. where, where you're like, you think you've got it bad? Well. <laughs> no, and if they're telling you about it, no need to share yeah. <laughs> your part necessarily. It's just sometimes a way for them to, under, to feel like they can relate and they can say that to you and mm -hmm. reach out. Mm -hmm. And then once they're talking to you, um, letting them know that there is help available like maybe if you know how to reach out to the HR department to get therapy at work or a school counselor or anything like that. If you know the doctor they need to get to to get the referral or yeah. whatever, you know, and offer to go with them. Yeah. Some people get scared to go on their own. Yeah, I think that is the best thing you can do is offer to just go with them if they need you because you can't force someone to go, can no. you? Because then they're not going for them, they're going for you. Mm -hmm. And they will, They'll, yeah, then that's just another thing that they're going to end up stressing about. Yeah, and that's why I don't ever tell people to do something. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't do anything, but you can be there. Right. And that's really the only thing that you can do. And I know it can make you feel helpless, but that's the best way to help them, is just to be there and to remind them there's help and go if they need it. Yeah, and, and, and if, you're, if you have a friend who is having a depressive episode, what do you reckon is the best thing you can do for them in that moment? Uh, I mean, there's lots of like lovely gifts on Tumblr. Bring them cuddles and, and blankets. <laughs> is that true or...? Um, I wouldn't say so. Not to like <laughs> knock someone's business plan or anything. Sure. <laughs> but I think, I think the best way is just to be there in person and just to check in on them. Mm. And often if you're trying to text them, you know they're at home and they're not responding, yeah. just pop by. You know, bring, I agree. bring a coffee or tea and be like, hey, I just want to hang out. And... Yeah, I think that's I think that's something that's what I want when I'm in when I'm having a code red, when I'm having a really bad time. I don't want someone to come and you know maybe necessarily do anything with me, but no. just, just to be there. Yeah, you know, like someone to do nothing. Like watch TV with, with you. Yeah, like I'm gonna continue binging my show. Do you want to just can you sit in the room with me? Let's mm -hmm. read comics together. Let's totally. uh, um, watch me play a video game. Yeah. Um, I think it's just nice to have that company. And you know, if nothing else, it can be the difference potentially between slipping from a code red to a code black. Yeah, because then you're reminded that there are people out there. Mm -hmm. There's always someone there. Yeah, exactly. Okay, hopefully that was actually very helpful. Um, that was sort of the journey of, of oh, you, you might have depression to don't kill yourself. That was there was a whole was a whole, gamut. whole narrative there. Um, yes, like I said before, Katie is a mental health uh, professional. She has an amazing channel full of just so many videos about absolutely everything. So. Not expert, definitely expert. Do check out her <laughs> channel. Um, she's got, like I said, so many videos on absolutely everything. We also did a video about me on her channel, which you can watch now. That can be like a little gateway drug. Um, but check her out, subscribe, give her a thumb and a comment. <laughs> I've been doing YouTube for 10 years. I really should have learned how to do this whole call to action thing. But thank you very much. Yeah, thanks and, for having me. And stay alive. Don't die. No. Not allowed. No. Tom has joined me. His channel name is Tomska, so don't get confused. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Tom. I'm a comedy writer and director. Comedy is subjective, so I maybe it's not it funny. funny. Well, that's your opinion.